This is Paul Tyler with another episode of That Annuity Show. And uh, in our virtual studio, uh, we have Mark Fitzgerald joining us after a long series of road trips. Mark, it's great to have you back. Paul, it's great to be back. Uh, Ramsey, as always, it's a pleasure. Yep. And uh, we have two really special guests with us today from uh, CUNY Mutual, who's also been a sponsor of our, our show. We appreciate it. But uh, also doing some really interesting uh, things to change not just products, but change really uh, who's involved and who's really driving the industry uh, in the future. And I'd like to welcome Martin Powell, head of annuity distribution at CUNY Mutual Group, and his colleague Gina Rappel, director of strategic accounts at CUNY Mutual Group. Uh, Martin and Gina, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, hey, th- hey, hey, thanks. And, and so the topic of, of the, the day is really, you know, um, it's Black History Month. Um, what does that really mean in terms of diversity, equity, inc- inclusion? And uh, what, what, what should it mean for the industry? And Ra- Ramsey, um, how would you want to, how do you think we should kick this off? So look, I think, uh, so, so the three of us, myself, Martin, and, and Gina have, uh, have committed a, you know, a, a meaningful all or a meaningful portion of our careers to the uh, to the insurance industry and uh, I think we I'm sure I'm sure they've found it as rewarding as, as I have and at the same time we see that there's if you look at the if you look at the uh, the populations that are served by the insurance industry uh, you can see scope for uh, expanded presence for from for more folks of African American uh, descent to be in various positions in the industry so uh, I, I I'm fortunate enough to serve on the board uh, of a major insurance company, and uh, and have had the pleasure of had the pleasure of uh, of, of building a business in the, on the distribution side, and uh, you know each of us has our own journey, and I guess it would be very interesting to find out from Martin and and, and Gina, you know what what drew you to this industry first and foremost. Tell us your story, and then on the back of that, it would be very interesting to hear what you think it will take to bring uh, more people of color. Uh, into uh, into the space. So, Gina, why don't we why don't we start with you? Okay, great. Uh, thank you for having me. And you know, I started in this industry over thirty years ago, and I started in, the, in at, at a bank actually on the teller line, and moved on to opening new accounts, and just kind of really started to see that you know people didn't know a lot about investing. Um, they didn't really understand it, and they came into the bank looking for help and for a solution. And so, you know, I did that while I was in college and then I was fortunate enough to, you know, move on to a mutual fund company where I got to learn a little bit more about investments and really taking it to the next level and providing financial securities um, to, to everyone. And so I just, I was really fascinated by that, you know, but I really consider myself lucky because I had no idea what a mutual fund um, was when I joined um, American Capital back in 1990, and I was fortunate that I had, um, you know, people kind of show me the way and help me realize how important it is to provide financial security um, to, to people. And so I just kind of grew up in the business, right? I knew nothing about it, but I learned about it and had just, you know, different opportunities. And I think what really happened for me is I found people that were willing to give me a chance. Right. I didn't look like anybody um, on our team. I didn't look like anyone out in the field, but um, I found someone or people that just saw something in me that I didn't know that I had. And the passion that I have for providing financial security, just the passion I have for this business. And so, you know, they took a chance on me and um, taught me the ropes. And, I, and I'm so, you know, I have people like Martin that still take a chance on me and, and give me opportunities that I wouldn't have normally had um, in my career. And so I'm just, I feel like that's kind of what we need to do for the next generation is we have to be willing to take a chance on people and teach them and um, show them this business and what, what it really means and what we're doing um, um, for people. So. I mean, that's, I just grew up. I just, I, I love it. I just, I can't imagine, and I talk to Martin about this all the time, like I can't imagine doing anything else. I, I feel like I was born to, to do this. It's, it's, it's easy for me. Um, I just love it. Martin, you're up. I started this business a similar time as Gina in 1990 uh, as a financial advisor for MetLife. And what drew me into the, the business was the opportunity to, to help families 
um, around life insurance. And when you deliver your first check, it really hits home on the power of this business. And also, as an advisor, it gave me an opportunity to educate uh, people, color and women, around um, preparing for the certainty in life of uncertainty. And that's something that's very, very purposeful and made me feel very, very good to, to be in this business, to continue to help as, as you uh, go through this journey. And, and as I travel through my journey and meeting uh, great people like Gina and, and others, yourself, Ramsey and Paul, the great thing about what I feel makes me drive every single morning. It's my duty to help people of color and women learn about this business and learn how you can create generational wealth, how you can um, help save and, and put your kids through college. All those great things that are driving towards the values for people really get me really excited about this business and just wanted to continue to just um, pass it on and, and continue to lead and, 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 and want people to say, hey, I want to do Martin's job, people of color and women. Or, hey, I want to be, I want to have, um, be CEO of an insurance company one day uh, because there's just so much power that you know, people of color missed out on because they just haven't been educated around money and the behavior around money. So I, I just so excited that um, we've been able to make, I've been able to make an impact on individuals as well as, 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 you know, with their investing as well as individuals with, with their career. So it's just, this is just a great business to be in. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. And um, I, I think, Martin, your, your comment about education is kind of interesting. Maybe we could, you know, kind of double-click on that a little bit. You know, Mark and I both worked at, at MetLife. I don't want to speak for, for Mark, but, um, you know, I've seen some interesting, you know, as I've moved from company to, or company or sector to sector, certain, and I don't know if it's the, the market, if it's the company, if it's the history, certain companies are much better about creating a more inclusive environment. MetLife, and I'm, and I'm not sure, you know, I, I don't think we were there at the same time. There was a significant top-down effort to build diversity in that company. Now, it no longer exists. You know, it's been sold in, in terms of the areas we were working. Um, we had some diversity, it, but I would not describe that as a, a diverse culture. Um, you know, move to some other organizations, um, you know, without naming them, um, uh, more focus on education, more focus on education of advisors. I've seen a lot more diversity. You know, some of the ones that kind of you know came up more from a uh, a part time basis. I mean, what's first of all, it you know I, again, I don't want to disparage Met or what it was, um, but is there something in the you know is it history? Is it just a, you know the the culture from the get go that makes one organization more successful than another? Yes. Spot on. It, what we're going through and and understanding, like CUNY Mutual, is is kind of late in the journey, but they're accelerating. It has to be top of mind for for the change to happen. It can't be um, an afterthought. It can't be like, hey, I'm on a journey, right? You you never go to the board and present your as an executive your business plan and say, hey, this us getting to our numbers is a journey. It's about putting concrete, measurable, actionable items to deliver on diversity. And the firms that do that are the firms that are, are having a success, that they, they are holding themselves accountable for going out and educating and attracting um, diversity. Because when you really dig in and understand it, that diversity, equity, inclusion, and, and fresh thoughts – it's really the multiplier for organizations. When you look at the organizations that have had a lot of success, they, they've changed the world. They didn't sit back and think about, you know, the same old way of doing things. 
and, and that, and the only way you get that is by making sure that you have people in your organization that are, um, just very, very diverse from not just, um, educational background, but experiences and ethnicities. Martin, you've, you've incorporated group leader retreats to focus in on inclusion. Can you talk a little bit about that and some of the success that you've had from, from that outcome? Yeah, our retreats, uh, unfortunately, were um, virtual, but very, very powerful. Um, and it was very, very eye-opening experience um, for all of us. And the great thing was, was the opportunity for us to really look in the mirror and be transparent. And I think the powerful thing that has been shared is, is that when people took the opportunity to hear my story, the aha moment went on that with some folks, and they've come up and, and approached me not only internally, but as well as externally, is, is that, well, I never realized, Martin, you, you could never hide that you were black. I could hide that I was Jewish. I could hide that, um, you know, if I came from a, a background and maybe I was uh, biracial, but I looked more, um, you know, on the more white. I could sit on white if I was of um, a different sexual orientation. You know, I don't, all those different things, which are important to identify, but if you walked in that culture, you could keep that on your personal side. And it was eye-opening to people that, hey, you know, we have these biases, these unconscious biases, and we see somebody and we ha unfortunately have these unconscious biases that we need to address and identify and then work on, you know, ultimately breaking those those biases down and, and saying, hey, this this is not founded. This is, this is, you know, we're all looking to achieve the same thing. And when you, you get to, in these conversations, people realize that, yeah, we want to have an inclusive environment, not an ex exclusive environment. And obviously, you know, focusing in from a corporate perspective is different than, you know, bringing um, individuals into the business. What other pathways um, are, are you going about in terms of education and, and helping individuals get into the business and get into wholesaling specifically? So we're really working with our recruiting folks, and, and it's an, an effort with the coalition of, of equity of wholesaling. Mm -hmm. It's really us going out early stage career college and really giving them an understanding of what financial services is, what financial services wholesaling is. It's going, making sure that you're going to the historically black colleges and universities, going to the state and private universities that have a high concentration of, of a of diverse student body and really educating them and, and really getting them excited that, as I mentioned in my intro, like this field is similar to saying, hey, I want to be a nurse, that you can impact somebody so greatly that, you know, they can be live comfortable in a, in a, in a very long retirement. No different than improving somebody's health that they got injured so they can have a good quality of life. So... It's us making sure that the that people can understand the transition. It's not the the wolf of Wall Street and selling stocks that people see in the in the you know in big boats and stuff. But this is really, hey, you can impact somebody like I, you can change their life by educating them and really feel good about what you do day in and day out. So, what do you see as your what are your primary competitors? For talent so like when you go out and you recruit um, what other kinds of companies are you you competing against because uh, you know sort of my experience is that that changed dramatically over the course of the last 20 or 30 years like there's I think there could be more choices and different choices different things are attractive now than they than they once were so where do you find the, the most competition when you when you find that that right candidate 
Oh, you, you find a lot of competition in the in the in the IT sector, right? Like you have people that can do IT, and I've done and I actually done some IT in, in my career in between um, being an advisor and coming back from the wholesale side. Um, it's very competitive because IT, as we know, is it's the engine, especially after the pandemic, and and. They're recruiting very heavily. They're paying extremely well, and um, they have a lot more flexibility. They they do things a little different, um, and we gotta we gotta make the we gotta adapt and, and make sure that we can provide that level of flexibility in the industry, make it fun, make it a, attractive. Um, but IT is where we see the, the greatest competition for talent, and then I would say. The medical field would be next. Got it. Okay. So the the other thing that, that was said earlier that I thought was intriguing and it sort of, again, reminds me of something I've seen a lot of is, uh, is you know, Gina. Gina, you talked about how there there were people that saw things in you that, that you didn't necessarily recognize in yourself, and so they empowered you. And you know, there are a couple – I see a couple things in there, right? So So one is – the concept of the uh, the importance of mentorship and sponsorship, and those are actually aren't necessarily the same thing. They're both important. Um, you know, how important was you know mentorship in the first order, and then sponsorship in the second order? Perhaps the more important of the two, in terms of your uh, the progression of your career. I really wouldn't say I had a, a mentor necessarily. Because there were no no one that looked like me. I mean, I'm four eleven. I weigh a hundred pounds, soaking wet. You know, I'm Hispanic. I mean, I was and I'm out there, right? I'm 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 strong. I got a strong personality, and there just wasn't a lot for me to choose from. So I had to find men that um, I liked the way they did business, and I respected them, and I wanted to be like that. And so I had to um, I, I used them, and sometimes they were mentors, and they didn't even know it. Um, and so. I just, I kind of had to build my own. It wasn't until I finally um, just said, I, I got to do this my way. I, I like that. I'm going to I'm gonna emulate that, but I'm going to do it my way. And then that's when I started attracting um, senior leaders saying, you know, I, I see something in you. I'm, I'm going to give you, like I said, give you that chance. But it wasn't, um, it was hard. It was really, really hard to find people. Um, I, and so that's why now um, as a woman, a Hispanic woman in this business, I am so passionate about leading and showing what um, people of color like me um, can do. Because I've said this to Martin before, you know, I, I really believe that if you can, you know, see it, you can be it. And so I, I just feel a huge sense of responsibility to um, show what it's supposed to look like. And I think we all have to do that. Um, we all have to walk the walk and talk the talk and we have to be intentional um, I think that is the key for me in my whole career is really, really being intentional and looking for, for the talent, um, looking um, for people that don't necessarily look like me, act like me, because that's what happened to me. As I remember when the manager said that to me, he said, I, I, I like you. You're different. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a chance. I'm going to put you out in the field. I'm going to see what happens. And then I ended up working for him again, like 15 years later. And he said, he recruited me away and I went to work for him again. And he was like, you were the best chance I ever took in my career. Um, and I was like, wow, thank you. You know? And so I just, I feel like sometimes the mentors aren't there. You got to find them. Um, you have to create your own. And I did that. And, but I don't want to make it hard for anyone to do that. I want to, make it easy for people to find mentors. And I am a mentor now. I mentor for the BISA Rising Star Program. And that's important to me. And I have a lot of young women that have asked me to mentor them. And so we do it at different levels, right? Yeah. Um, and even sponsor, and, and the whole sponsorship thing too. I've had people come to me and say, oh, I, I want to sponsor you. Um, but I find with the sponsorship sometimes it's more equal playing field though. Um, like I can help them just as much as they can help me. So that's a, that's so a superpower. I, yeah, it right. is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I, I've always found mentorship is my best mentors have not been ones that have been, you know, assigned me by some corporation or some HR department. 
Gene, as you said, it, it just sort of happens, but that also implies you've got a critical mass of people who could be candidates for doing that. Um, what's critical mass inside an organization? You also mentioned BISA, and Martin and, and Gene, I'd love to get your perspectives on this. How much of that critical mass can be created you know, across companies and still accomplish the same purpose? Can, can these substitute for critical mass in company or in, inside companies, or does it have to go hand in hand? Mm. I think critical mass is a great question. It's, it's so important, and it's kind of it's kind of like uh, bottled water or fast food, right? Like the more you you get companies, even though we're competing for talent the more people you get excited about it, the more people you get consuming bottled water and, and fast food, right? And we can get people, companies can, you know, hiring more women and, and minorities. And companies, when you look at talent and population growth, you, you're gonna miss out if you don't focus on hiring the best and, and brightest. And I always say that um, hard work and intelligence doesn't discriminate. It's available across everybody. So it's it's available. I think that the the the, the challenge the challenge always is is it you know how well is it recognized? So as I as we as we went through this discussion, you know a few things kind of hit home. So you know. I sort of jumped when, when, when Gina mentioned that there was uh, that somebody said I took a chance on you. That was the best chance I ever took. I think you know in life, in life, people that are in positions of power, you know, fundamentally start with well, I have to sort of maintain my position of power, and that can tend to make them a bit conservative. And that also means that as they as they sort of bring people up behind them, they sort of bring in people and skill sets and things that that, that feel very familiar because that's in their comfort zone. But the but the challenge the challenge around diversity has been and always been that um, that people of color have had to sort of build and demonstrate their success in very different ways, right? And so those that could sp spend, sponsor mentor uh, could make a difference have to have to be able to figure out ways to recognize recognize those skills and how they've manifested themselves, and and have to be willing to quote unquote take that chance. And and from my perspective, often it's not nearly as much, uh, it's not as big a chance as maybe the person uh, taking that leap is is taking. It's just they don't actually necessarily recognize risk. Sorry, my phone keeps ringing here. They don't recognize. Um, they just don't recognize the 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 um, uh, again the way the talent manifests itself in the same way. So, you know, I, I think. Both the stories we've heard have been have been really you know in inspiring here, and 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 the message is. The message is to make a difference. It's more than just having programs. It's, it's taking some taking some chances on on people that have demonstrated ambition and raw skill. No question there. Just a, a comment. Yeah, G absolutely. And 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 also to piggyback on that, Ramsey is is getting rid of this unconscious bias, and that's what um, these retreats were great about because. The unconscious bias is real. It, it's, it's the NFL, like, look what's going on with the NFL. 70% of the players are, are of color. And when it comes to the management, the people who are making decisions in the management, they, they just have the biases. It's not about the ability. I mean, because we've seen black coaches be super successful. M Mike Tomlin, 15 years of winning straight seasons, right? Like, mm -hmm. the, the, it just goes on and on. So it's that unconscious, ultimately, you just got to just stop it and say, you know what? I need to get past this unconscious bias. It's not, there's not, the risk is not any greater by hiring somebody of color or a woman. It's the same risk. Don't think about it. That it's going to be a greater risk, change, and that's it's got to yeah. change. Uh, Gina, what you know, if you could give one word of advice to people listening to the show who are in positions where they make hiring decisions, recruiting decisions, what would it be? Um, I just think people have to be intentional. 
Like they have to go and, and be willing and open-minded um, and be willing to give people a chance. I, I just think that sometimes it's just easy to go with what you know, right? And it's simple and let's just do that. But but we can't, if, if, if we're gonna change, we're gonna take this to the next level, we can't do that. We have to be willing to, um, to think outside the box and think long-term and, and be intentional about that because I, I think sometimes we take the easy route um, and just go with what we know and, and we're never going to get anywhere if we continue to do that. Yeah. Hey, well, we're, we're kind of at the top of the show. Mark, Mark any final thoughts or, or questions? Yeah, so Martin, I guess in, in, in 2022, you know, in terms of bringing – the unconscious bias to a conscious level. Um, what would you, like? What would you consider a successful transition in 2022 from your organization standpoint? I was picking back on what Gina said is that making sure that the leaders are intentionally seeking these opportunities to get people of color in through the interview process. Are they intentionally working on their journey? around their their biases and that they believe that it, when it's absolutely true it's the multiplier effect for for organizations that have a diverse workforce the diversity of ideas it's going to move your workforce forward well said thank you so w one thing that i will uh you know I, I i will add is that uh i think it's often underappreciated you know what the opportunity is to to work with uh, whether it's whether it's people of color or women. It, there's there's an opportunity to find people that are very comfortable in, in taking some risk and actually uh, pursuing opportunities where um, that are more entrepreneurial and where where outcomes are less defined. You know what you'll find, particularly in big organizations. You know, they're usually, you know, the best accounts. I mean, I experienced this in my Wall Street career. Like there's, right, there's the best, the, the big name accounts that everybody sort of is going for. And then usually there's some other, some set of opportunities that are inside the four walls of the business. And, you know, often people of color end up pursuing those opportunities either because that's what's left for them or sometimes they end up pursuing the opportunity because they say, you know what? If I pursue this, I pursue this undefined opportunity, the, the account that's never really been successful before, the region that's never been successful, whatever it happens to be, I know that I can actually, because I'll be in isolation, if I make this work, it will be very clear what my impact was in this space. Whereas if I'm on the big account and I'm, I'm on with a large group of people, like my, my worth will not necessarily be as, as readily, readily visible. So what that means is, and what that means is you uh, you can often find sort of fantastic entrepreneurial personalities, uh, you know, by, by looking for people that are that are diverse and have made that and have made that journey, and who often you know rely more on strength of skills versus strength of personality. The, those, both those things matter to success in life, but uh, very often if you're that type of person, you really focus on strength of skills. And so there's a, I think there's a lot of untapped potential there that is just not being seen. So I, I will, I'll end with that because that's, that's been my experience in my own career, and, and I, see it, I see it all the time. Yeah. Very well said. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, I guess, uh, Martin, and, and uh, first of all, Gina, Martin, thank you so much. Uh, Martin, where, where should people go to learn more about what Keena Mutual is doing and what you're doing? Um, uh, is there a, a link on your website or, um, you know, uh, w w what's the best way to get a perspective of, of, of CUNA's commitment in this area? Uh, you can go to our website and, and look at our social responsibility statement and our DEI initiatives on our website. And then um, you can also, is leading the, the, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Board at, at the yeah, and it, you can go there for, for a wealth of information as well. And then the Coalition of Equity and Wholesalers is another good uh, resource to get information. Uh, terrific. 
and Gina, thank you so much. Um, what, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? If they have questions or, or uh, want to share experiences or get in touch and find, find mentors or sponsors? <laughs> they can always email me at gina.repo at gmail.com or call me on the phone. Oh. Seven one three eight two five seven. Uh oh, <laughs> are you sure you have car warranty insurance? Okay, yeah, we'll. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Hey, listen, thanks so much, uh, Martin, Gina, Ramsey, Mark. Uh, thank all of our listeners, and hey, join us again next week for another episode of that annuity show. Thanks.